everyone. Welcome to Unchained, your no-hype resource for all things crypto. I'm your host, Laura Shin. If you've been enjoying Unchained, pop on iTunes to give us a top rating or review. That helps other listeners find the show. Sun Exchange is a solar power marketplace for the crypto economy. Sun Exchange members all over the world are earning cryptocurrency for helping to deliver solar power generation to businesses and communities in emerging markets. Visit thesunexchange.com to start earning solar powered money today. Start Engine is a regulated ICO platform with a community of 155,000 plus registered users that's focused on issuing tokenized securities. Go to startengine.com slash unchained for a 20% discount on setup services to launch your regulated ICO. This is not legal advice. My guest today is Nadav Hollander, founder of Dharma Protocol. Welcome, Nadav. Thank you so much, Laura. It's good to be here. What is Dharma Protocol? So Dharma is a protocol that enables borrowing and lending of crypto assets on blockchains like Ethereum. Um, So you can basically kind of think of it as this infrastructure layer that sits on top of the Ethereum blockchain um, that enables any internet connected application to programmatically tap into a line of credit um, or a vehicle of savings in the form of crypto assets. And so kind of our our general goal here um, is to build the infrastructure today that in, you know, five years or so will power the financial services of the so-called open financial system. So how does Dharma work? Walk me through an example of how someone might borrow money using the Dharma protocol. So, um, so there's a couple of things that are worth clarifying. So, so first of all, Dharma is a protocol and not an end user application in and of itself, right? So, our our users aren't necessarily borrowers and lenders per se, but more so application developers that kind of tap into our infrastructure and build the actual uh, online storefronts for these experiences. Now, if we're going to kind of walk through this from the the borrower perspective, like what it would look like for them to tap into a line of credit um, that was originated via Dharma. Basically, at least today, the majority of volume on the protocol is sourced by what we call relayers. Um, so essentially, th- like if you're going to have a, a debt agreement, there's kind of two things that need to happen, right? On, on one hand, you need some way of administering that debt agreement. So you need some way of actually kind of tracking how many repayments have occurred, um, of making sure repayments are sort of funneled to the correct beneficiary at any given time. And then you also need some way of actually like, essentially like bringing that debt agreement into fruition, like somehow matching the borrower and lender, um, finding a essentially a source of credit for that borrower. And so in order to solve that latter problem, uh, we've introduced this concept called essentially relayers, uh, which are these kind of like centralized actors that host some sort of order book online that you can kind of imagine as looking like a bulletin board where borrowers can essentially post requests for different types of loans. And then if a creditor comes in and decides that they want to invest in one of those loans, then that relayer is going to earn a fee, essentially. This might sound very familiar if you're familiar with the, um, with the Zero X protocol. It is a highly analogous concept. And basically, the idea there is that anybody in the world can start one of these relayers. You don't need permission from, from Dharma Labs. If Dharma Labs was to go like bankrupt tomorrow, this mechanism could still function, essentially. Yeah. For listeners who have not heard my episode with Will Warren of Zero X, you should definitely go back and check that out because he did describe very similar concepts. So what problems are you trying to solve? Like what problems in debt or lending can be resolved using this protocol rather than a centralized service? So yeah, I I mean, first of all, at like a higher level, I'd say that just in general, if you've been in the blockchain industry for a while, Basically, like there's always been this concept of quote unquote banking the unbanked um, that's been very popular as a supposed use case for blockchains, i.e., like building financial services that are fundamentally globally accessible and more equitable and transparent, etc. Realistically, like that utopic vision of like you know we're going to bank the two billion unbanked using cryptocurrencies, like that's probably a little far right now. But if you kind of start there and work like backwards in terms of the things that we need in order to enable that, um, there's a lot of fundamental building blocks that need to be created. Um, This includes things like stable coins, aka um, tokens that are in some way uh, pegged to a stable fiat asset. 
or this includes things like having like good derivative markets or good mechanisms for actually trading tokens. And crucially, one of those pieces is having a robust decentralized credit market. Because you know, if if we zoom into the future and imagine one day that a um, you know a borrower in Ghana is on an application on their phone and they press a button and they're instantly able to access some sort of line of credit in the background, that like application um, needs to somehow be able to tap into a decentralized credit market in order to actually source that liquidity. And so essentially, the problem that we're trying to solve is basically to fill that gap. We're trying to to basically build a both a decentralized manner of matching borrowers and lenders for credit liquidity and a decentralized manner of actually administering a loan throughout its life cycle without having to have any sort of intermediary standing between the borrower and the lender. And there are actually a lot of fintech companies now that do this kind of thing. You know, maybe a lot of the ones I'm thinking of actually mainly serve the US markets, but I do Mm -hmm. think there are ones that are um, maybe more international as well. So why is it better to do this in a decentralized fashion rather than on some of these really big services like Lending Club or SoFi or whatever it might be? So I think it's crucial to to remember that like while the internet has kind of evolved in a manner where it's kind of it has no real conception of borders um, and is kind of like globally accessible, you know, with an asterisk there for like certain despotic countries. It's not like if you're in Ghana or in Karnataka, India, or in, uh, you know, name X country, it's not like you can go to LendingClub.com and take out a loan from that website, right? Um, and, and the reason for that is that while the internet doesn't necessarily have, like, robust concepts of borders, the banking system, which pretty much any sort of financial service today is heavily coupled to, very much so has a concept of borders and very much so is kind of coupled to um, geographic locales. And so that means that it's like it's it's not like if you're if you're a lending club and you're trying to expand operations, it's not like it's trivially easy to to turn the lights on on, you know, enabling support for like Ghana or something like that. Right. Because there's this like highly friction laden bottleneck at the point of the actual banking infrastructure. Um, and so the argument that I would make is that with something like a decentralized credit market where there's no sort of centralized institution that needs to kind of stand as a cog in the middle, there's so much less of a regulatory burden that needs to be undertaken by some sort of central party that's going to kind of bring together the world's credit markets because there is no central party, right? And it's kind of like it's kind of like imagining like what would the internet have looked like if like instead of being created on top of open standards, it looked more like an AOL uh, or instead was kind of like this like closed network that you know people had to be permissioned onto. And, and so I, I would argue that by having a decentralized network for actually sourcing credit liquidity, you kind of... It's almost like a regulatory arbitrage in some senses. Well, in that regard, if there are certain regulations around like who can lend to whom or under what conditions, then could those be circumvented using this? And so in that sense, is this a way around those regulations? Like, is, is this, you know, basically going to lead to illegal ending? Um, I don't necessarily think that that is the express purpose of it. Um, and I don't think that that's like what will represent the majority of what happens on this platform. Look, in general, when you're when you're touching cryptocurrencies, the whole the whole idea of this asset class is that like with permissionless innovation, a lot of use cases become essentially a lot more user friendly um, and a lot more globally accessible, and that's great. But permissionless innovation is very much like a double edged sword, um, and this is you know I'm sure you've been in this industry for a long time. This is discussed in pretty much like every every use case that's ever been discussed in cryptocurrency has its dark side. Um, I feel like this is like a question that comes up in every one of my podcast episodes. Yeah, no, no, definitely. Um, and I think that that's like it's something that that us as technologists in the space have to like wrestle with, which is like what are the negative consequences of what we're building. I would argue, however, that much like the internet itself, which had its terrorist chat rooms back in its heyday and uh, back in its salad days, rather, and that was an easy way to write off, you know, a permissionless information network's capabilities. I would argue that as a nice heuristic, like empirically, these things tend to turn out net positive. And so I think that the amount of people that would benefit from being able to access a line of credit online who may not have previously been able to 
um, will outweigh the you know the drug dealers and traffickers who may be able to access credit when they were prior not unable to. One thing I thought you might say there was that the underwriters and the real heirs themselves could kind of like impose those you know regulatory restrictions, but but you but they actually can't. Is that what you're... they actually can? Right. Oh, so okay. I mean that's that's actually a very fair question. So I think it's worth like taking a step back and perhaps like giving a much more like step by step overview of how the protocol works. I think I gave a very glossy high level explanation earlier. So so maybe I'll dive into more of the nuts and bolts. So essentially, the, there are two different actors classes of actors in the protocol, right? There are what are called underwriters and relayers. And so relayers, as I explained pre- previously, are essentially these centralized actors that that host orders from, from borrowers um, and essentially match them with lenders in some capacity um, and earn fees for that. Um, now, naturally, the question that comes up is like, okay, like who... Like, how am I supposed to know as a lender on this network that a borrower is credit worthy when they're just, you know, an address of, uh, of letters and numbers um, with no kind of prior history? And so this is essentially where the concept of underwriters comes in. Underwriters are centralized actors that basically vouch for their belief of a borrower's likelihood of default. So essentially, a borrower is going to come to them and the underwriter is going to say, I believe borrower X has a Y percent chance of defaulting of their loan. And they're going to cryptographically attest to that. Um, and the idea is that similarly to the relayers, they could um, they would look like earn a fee, essentially, if that loan is filled. So, so taking a step back to your question, yes, that is correct. As in like, like the, the relayers and underwriters, if they were to have somehow facilitated you know, a transaction, let's just say, to an OFAC sanctioned individual, like somebody who's like in Iran, let's just say, then yes, they could face legal consequences to that. And so so it's it's likely that they would have to implement some sort of check to make sure that, that doesn't happen. Um, but I think in the abstract, like if we're talking about a network in which anybody can build a relay or anybody can build an underwriter, that doesn't necessarily categorically mean that every relayer and underwriter is going to be benevolent and compliant. I find this to be kind of analogous to just like Bitcoin in general, right? It's like you can buy and sell Bitcoin on many different exchanges. Those exchanges very much lie on a spectrum of how much they respect the sanctity of of yes. you know various money transmission and securities laws. Huge um, spectrum. In a very, very large spectrum, right? So I think that it's 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 a similar sort of dynamic. And our philosophy is that it's like these like like jurisdiction specific compliance protections don't necessarily belong at the core protocol layer. Uh, and that it makes a lot more sense for those to be uh, essentially enforced at the application layer instead. Let's go back to the underwriters. How do Dharma underwriters assess potential borrowers' creditworthiness? Is it just each has their own method of doing it? or? So yeah, I mean, so we don't necessarily define exactly how they're supposed to do it. The, 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 whole, the whole idea is that it's basically there's this marketplace for underwriters, right? And uh, these underwriters are kind of like known centralized institutions. And if they do a particularly good job of underwriting loans, then that will be like markedly visible on chain, right? Because you, let's just say like I am considering making an investment in a loan that a certain underwriter has vouched for. I can look up all loans that are associated with their address. I can see the sort of predictions they had made as to the borrower's creditworthiness every single time. And I can compute kind of a, a heuristic score of that underwriter's like, quote unquote, trustworthiness. And so at the protocol layer, we don't necessarily define like, you know, the underwriter has to pull a FICO score or they have to go and, you know, like, I don't know, like get a blood test done on like the borrower or, huh. you know, use some crazy data points. Like, you know, these things like these things lie completely undefined at the protocol layer because essentially the incentive mechanism is set up such that like underwriters by whatever under like by whatever magic method, if they're really good at their job, they're going to get more business. And if they're really bad at their job, they're going to get less business. And do you imagine that the underwriters will be like existing underwriters or new types of underwriters that that try to take advantage of this protocol? So I think that that's a really interesting question. So I, you know, like I find it less likely that these will be kind of traditional debt underwriters, and much more likely that these will be upstart lending businesses, particularly trying to underwrite classes of debt that 
don't really even exist in the real world right now. And I'll give you a couple examples. So there's there's a lot of like use cases for lending that are like highly specific to the cryptocurrency industry and wouldn't have made sense in a sentence like if you were to, you know, talk about them 10 years ago. So so one example is like there's this emerging class of crypto collectibles, right? The most notable example being CryptoKitties, but you know, there's there's tons of these nowadays. I think I think if you go on OpenSea, which is an exchange for buying and selling these, um, there's something like you know like a million different NFTs listed on there. It's something huh. crazy. And so something that something that we're really interested in is like these these non fungible assets can become extremely valuable, right? And essentially, with, with Dharma, you can actually take a loan out against one of those assets. So you could like almost in the same way that a mortgage is a, a loan backed by a house, like you can take like, you know, your extremely rare crypto kitty that's worth $100,000 and, and take out a line of credit against it. Now, um, you know, you might be wondering why I'm talking about this in the context of underwriters. Um, what's kind of funny about that is that if you're an inv- if you're a creditor and you're thinking about investing in this kitty backed loan per se, somebody needs to appraise the value of that crypto kitty, right? right. Um, somebody needs to like come in and actually be able to like assign like what would be the fair market value of this crypto kitty today, and insofar as that's the case, like what is the likelihood that you know this lender would not be made whole um, if like the borrower defaulted. And so, and so I give that example because it's like you can imagine that an underwriter emerges that focuses essentially on appraising the value of, of digital collectible assets. Mm-hmm. Uh, and personally, I find those sort of niche classes of crypto native debt to be much more likely to emerge than for a kind of traditional underwriter of like, you know, unsecured personal loans or like, you know, credit card refinancing or what have you uh, jumping into this market. Because like it's you know like the UX in this space is so difficult like all around right like it's like 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 even just even interacting with the D app in any capacity requires you to like do crazy stuff like install MetaMask and you know save your seed phrase and all this sort of stuff. Um, so we find it much more likely that the use cases that are going to be compelling in the short term are going to be people who want to borrow crypto assets and are like comfortable interacting with crypto assets. And so I think naturally, as a result of that, that means that the sorts of underwriters that will be ex- attracted to the network will, will similarly be kind of crypto native. What happens in that case where someone puts up a crypto kitty as collateral, but then the value of the crypto kitty falls? What, how does that work? <laughs> well, so it's, it's interesting you say that. So we're actually at the moment working on adding margin calling functionality to the network, um, where essentially like... This is perhaps more relevant with like uh, like fungible assets, like with like say something like if you had ether up for collateral, and uh, um, you know you have like a regular spot price for that ether. <laughs> so 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 with a crypto kitty, it's a little bit harder to say, but but I, I can tell you that in the concept of that that if you're talking about a loan that is backed by a fungible asset, yeah. uh, essentially when the collateral drops below like a certain threshold, then the uh, the collateral becomes eligible for liquidation. And so I guess you'd have to in in the crypto kitty example, you'd have to get some sort of like rolling notion of like what the crypto kitty's value is. But that's kind of hard to do because it's a non fungible asset and not necessarily like a something that you can pull a spot price on like ether. Okay. So what happens if a bo- if a borrower defaults? So this is very case by case, right? Intentionally, we've built the protocol to be like very flexible and unopinionated, and so essentially, you can kind of think of it as like there is like an open source set of loan templates that people can use in the protocol, um, and they define everything from like super simple unsecured loans to loans that are collateralized with some sort of non fungible token to loans that um, are you know very like very much oriented towards speculative use cases and are like you know intended for say like shorts and things like that. And, and, and essentially, like the, each of these classes of loans has their own sort of default deterrence mechanism associated with them. So right now, uh, you know, we've been live on mainnet since around May. The vast majority of volume in Dharma is uh, represented by like, loans that are overly collateralized by some other asset, right? So it'll be like, I put up a hundred dollars of dye and borrowed like fifty dollars worth of ether against it, and the the basic default deterrence mechanism there is that if I don't pay back my fifty dollars worth of ether, then my dye is going to get seized by the lender. So it's very simple. 
but there are other classes of loans in which the 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 penalties for defaulting could be very different, right? Like you could imagine that there would be an underwriter that um, essentially originated the borrower, right? They 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 kind of the the borrower comes to their website, applies for a loan, the underwriter approves them, kind of assigns a sort of score to them, and then in addition to actually you know, taking their order and forwarding it off to a relayer in order to kind of complete the lending process, they actually have the borrower sign like a meat space le- like lending contract, right? Like a, a real legal contract that has some like real legal stipulations as to what might happen to them if they were to default on the loan. Um, and the underwriter has an incentive to do that because they are, you know, they're they're going to get compensated on the basis of how good of a job they're doing. Because if they you know, if they underwrite a lot of good loans, they're going to get more business. Right. So, so you know, in short, uh, we've intentionally kind of left that portion undefined and instead try to define the incentives of the, the protocol at large such that if you're underwriting and originating good debt, then you're going to get compensated more by the market. Okay. And to take a step back, how are debts paid back? So, they're... So this is actually kind of like one of the the beauties of the protocol is that in in the traditional financial system there's this construct of what are called paying agents, right? Where essentially like if a loan, like let's just say you take out a mortgage, that bank like now owns like uh that loan, right? They own the right to be repaid uh or to, you know, foreclose on your house. And what tends to happen in the financial system is that they're going to go and then, you know, sell that loan to some other bank. And then that bank is going to go and, you know, package that loan with a bunch of other loans and then take that package and sell it and so on and so forth. And the problem is, is that if you're the borrower, like you, this is totally unknown to you in the background. And it's not like you know who, like, the end user is that actually is the, the final beneficiary of your loan at any given time. Um, all you know is that you need to, like, you know, pay back a certain you know, through a certain portal on the bill that got sent to you in the mail. Um, And so the person who's taking that buck is a paying agent, right? They are a person that's whose job is to basically take the money and, and, you know, by some way, shape or form, funnel it to its correct beneficiary um, as stipulated in like various legal contracts. Now, the way that Dharma works um, is that essentially we do away with the concept of there being any sort of individual that has to keep track of who owns the loan. Um, and instead, we have a smart contract that administers the entire life cycle of the loan. So, um, so you can imagine that in, in the Dharma example, um, if Alice were to lend $100 to Bob, and then Alice were to go off and sell her loan to you know Charlie, Bob doesn't need to have any sort of knowledge of that. If Bob wants to repay his loan, he basically sends his money back to like the loan smart contract and the loan smart contract automatically routes it to whoever is supposed to be the given beneficiary at that time. And so essentially you kind of get to add a lot of the efficiencies of essentially like cryptocurrency trading, but to the world of debt capital markets. And so basically the borrower needs to put the payments into whatever address it is that is part, you know, uh, delineated in the smart contract to make those payments from and if they don't, then it goes into the default mode and whatever happens in the default is determined by the underwriter. The, um, not, it's determined by the loan contract itself. Oh, okay. um, and that can sometimes be adjudicated by the underwriter, but often it can be some sort of penalty that has nothing to do with like any sort of underwritten agreement. Right. Okay. Like um, the majority of the loans in Dharma today, there is no underwriter even involved in them. It's just a contract that holds the collateral and that if the borrower does not repay, then the collateral gets seized. OK. And earlier you talked about serving these kind of like unbanked populations, but you were mainly naming ones abroad. Mm-hmm. Are, are it like, can you just tell me all the populations you think that could be served by this protocol now that are not mm. ser- served by the traditional credit markets? Yeah. Super good question. So, so I think I can answer this in like kind of like two tiers. Like one, which is like more realistic, like today use cases, as in like you know not pie in the sky sci fi sort of stuff, and then like the kind of like five years out or ten years out, whatever the whatever the time right. horizon is that we think it is that's realistic. So, so in in the long term, I think like yes, like there are you know something like two billion unbanked people in the world, and all of them are rapidly coming online. 
And though they can go onto Facebook.com and make a social networking account, they can't necessarily go onto Lending Club and take out a loan. So, so I think like in the long term, like these are the people that we're really excited about. There's a lot of credit markets in the world that have just like totally insane conditions um, that aren't even necessarily like third world countries per se. Um, that would benefit a lot from things like this. For, for instance, Brazil has some of the highest APRs in the world. Um, and, you know, is solidly like a developed country, um, very technology, technology literate, very modern. But just because of just the way the like, like socioeconomic reality on the ground has developed, like APRs, are just like totally insane. Now, that's all like long term stuff. And I, I think like it's, you know, it's, it's fun to think of that sort of stuff. But like realistically, until cryptocurrencies are more scalable and easy to use, that's like probably not what's going to happen. I'd say in the short term... The, the people who we think most about are either people who are like very much on the margins of the current Western financial system or are people in the cryptocurrency industry specifically who for some reason need to access a line of credit. So, so in the latter category, the kind of lion's share of it is basically people who are trying to borrow and lend for speculative purposes, right? It's people who are essentially like, I need to, you know, I, I feel bearish about a certain token and I want to short it. And so I'm going to borrow that token and then sell it and then purchase it back later and return it. Or it's people trying to get leverage on their assets in some capacity. But I think that like that, that category of crypto native use cases actually has a lot of facets to it that aren't necessarily speculative, but that just kind of like solve problems that are niche to that actually crypto ecosystem, right? So uh, I'll give you a certain example. Are, are you familiar with what Plasma is? Yeah. So so Plasma is this, um, this kind of framework for scalability uh, on top of Ethereum. And essentially, like the, the way the concept works at like a really high level is that you take your tokens on the main chain, you deposit them onto a plasma chain. Um, the plasma chain is, you know, presumably much more efficient. And then once you want to like go back to the main chain, you need to like withdraw your coins out of there, right? The problem is, is that for a whole bunch of different reasons, when you're withdrawing those coins, there's kind of like this like seven to fourteen day like thawing period, uh, at least in the current designs that they have for it. Um, and that's kind of a crappy UX if you're like, you know, a normal user of any application ever. Like the normal banking system. Yeah, anyway. like the normal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we're trying to build things that are better than the normal banking right. system, right? And so I think there's like, this is an example of somewhere where there's a really interesting use case for debt, right? Because essentially, if you had somebody that just fronted you the money, like right off the bat, and kind of was able to like buy the risk of that, you know, of you defaulting essentially because of, you know, X, Y, Z technical reasons in the plasma uh, specification, um, then we can make UX like much, much better, right? right. Um, and so I, I like to list that as an example of like, there being crypto native use cases for borrowing and lending that aren't even like underserved now. They're just entirely unserved right now because they like don't exist. And um, they aren't even necessarily speculation related themselves. Now, and before I forget, I wanted to go into the kind of other category of what I view as being use cases that are uh, viable in the short term, which are like people who are kind of on the edges of the financial system even in like the Western world today. Yeah. Um, and this is like a really interesting category of people, right? So, so one example would be like gray market businesses. Um, so for instance, like if you are a marijuana dispensary, right? It's not necessarily mm. you can go over to a Wells Fargo and take out a loan from them because they have, you know, a million and a half different compliance requirements that are going to forbid them from doing that. And so I think it's really interesting to imagine a world in which the sort of like this emerging cannabis industry, which is projected to be like bigger than the wine industry and is um, just growing at this like unbelievably rapid rate, is able to access credit financing in a manner not unlike how people raise ICOs right now, right? And so I think a lot of use cases on on the kind of margins of the financial system like that are interesting as well. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. I, I feel like every conversation I have is somewhat similar where people are saying like speculation is one use case and then sort of these kind of regulatory gray areas. We're going to discuss why Dharma doesn't have a token and how uh, Nadav got into crypto. But first, I'd like to take a quick break for our fabulous sponsors. Interested in raising capital through a security token offering? Start Engine is your full stack solution. 
Start Engine, a regulated ICO platform with a community of over 155,000 registered users, was founded in 2014 by Howard Marks, co-founder of Activision Blizzard. Since the implementation of the Jobs Act, Start Engine has helped over 160 companies raise capital. In fact, Start Engine can help a company build its own tokens and is creating a secondary market upon which those tokens can be traded. In short, Start Engine provides a complete token ecosystem. If your company wants to launch a security token offering, just go to startengine.com slash unchained for a free consultation and a 20% discount on future regulated ICO setup services. That's startengine.com slash unchained. This is not legal advice. Sun Exchange is a solar power marketplace for the crypto economy. Sun Exchange members all over the world are earning cryptocurrency while solar powering businesses and communities in emerging markets. Through the sunexchange.com, for as little as $10, and in just a few clicks, you can purchase solar cells and lease them to projects in the world's sunniest regions, earning you an income stream of monetized sunshine paid in Bitcoin. Sun Exchange members can earn between 10 and 15% IRR, backed by the power of the sun. Founded in 2015, Sun Exchange is operating solar projects across Southern Africa, entirely powered by our members' solar cells. Our partners include SolarCoin, the United Nations Development Programme, and the Energy Web Foundation. Visit www.thesunexchange.com to check terms and eligibility to join the crypto solar revolution. Start earning solar-powered money today. Actually, when I was reading about all the things you can do with Dharma, there were a couple things that you um, had written about or, or spoken about on podcasts that interested me, and I just want you to like briefly describe them. Yeah, totally. Initial debt offerings or tokenized SAFs, yeah. trustless savings accounts, and tokenized municipal bonds. Yeah, definitely. So, um, okay, what was the first one on there? The uh, tokenized SAFs. Yeah, the or tokenized initial debt SAFs. Yeah, so something that some this is something that we're like pretty interested in. We haven't seen anybody do it yet, but basically, it's like like the the ICO boom that happened in 2017 was almost entirely based around like selling tokens to the public that had like equity like properties to them, right? Like you know, people buy these things because they think they have like a certain chance of going to the moon or they're going to go to zero. And what's kind of interesting is that in the real world, like equity like assets are actually a much smaller of the global economy, a much smaller portion of the global economy than like debt. Right. Uh, like I think like the, the, you know, I'm going to pull these numbers uh, out of my head right now and they might be a little bit inaccurate, but I, I think like the global market cap of glo- of like equities is like somewhere around like 70 trillion, whereas like the market cap of global debt assets is like 210 trillion or something like that. Um, and so it's kind of interesting to imagine of like, what if we could take the ICO model and apply it essentially to like debt fundraisers, right? Um, so essentially, um, you could benefit from selling tokens that like plug natively into this kind of infrastructure for this global infrastructure for either custodying or trading or you know building on applications on top of or whatever crypto assets and have them be debt assets uh, like you know that look much like say a corporate bond would um, so so one use case that we're pretty excited about is just really like allowing companies of all shapes and sizes to be able to like raise debt from the general public uh, in a way that has a very low kind of initial fixed cost to get set up. And what about, I, I'm interested in these trustless savings accounts and the tokenized municipal bonds as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so so trustless savings accounts. So again, this 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 probably falls into the, the a bit more sci-fi category, but we're really excited to see somebody build this out. Essentially, if you have... Once you have like a good decentralized credit market, right, and you have all these different like classes of debt that an application can kind of go in and source liquidity from, you could imagine that we created a savings account that was entirely administered by a smart contract. And so you could imagine like savers would put their funds into this smart contract, and the smart contract would automatically invest in uh, certain classes of loans of a certain risk threshold um, from the Dharma Credit Network, and so it's this really interesting concept where you're like, you can imagine basically like banks existing um, that have no person at the helm of them and have no marketing budget and have no compliance budget and there's no person that has to like sit there in a suit and shake hands with you, um, and so like a tremendous amount of inefficiency is kind of like shaved out of the system. Um, and so we're really excited about seeing that that concept come to fruition. Though I would argue that it's kind of like a, 
that's like that's like we're at step one right now. That's like step five or six, right? right. <laughs> yeah, and the last one, tokenized municipal and then bonds. tokenized municipal bonds. Yeah, so. Um, I think this is a really interesting concept. Um, there's there's a lot of municipalities in the world who aren't necessarily... So, so sorry, let me take a step back for a second. Municipalities raise debt all the time, right? Like municipalities need to like build parks and they need to like invest in schools and they need to invest in like public infrastructure in different capacities. And so they'll often go to an investment bank and have that investment bank help them issue a municipal bond. Um, and, you know, this is how some like the most like iconic infrastructure in the world was built. And that's great. And this system functions fantastically, but it doesn't necessarily function equally well for everybody, right? Like there are a lot of people uh, or a lot of municipalities, particularly outside of the Western world, that may not have access to the same friendly credit conditions that, um, say, a San Francisco might or, uh, you know, an Oakland might or what have you. And so it's interesting to imagine, you know, the concept that I kind of outlined earlier of like a business doing a debt ICO taking that and kind of extrapolating it to the next step where you have a municipality or even a sovereign nation uh, issuing debt uh, on chain and selling it as a token. So it's, you know, again, this goes back to like the double edged sword conversation, because like, there's a lot of municipalities and sovereign nations that like, rightfully so we don't want having access to the financial system, right. But I would make an argument that I think that if you open up this market more, the benefits will outweigh the cons. Yeah, that's been a theme in some recent podcasts because we've been talking about like what's been going on in Venezuela and stuff like that. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. It's like what happens when Venezuela like tries to like raise a bond on the blockchain. Right. (laughs) Right. In addition to their Petro. Yeah, yeah. I'm speaking with Indav Hollander, founder of Dharma Protocol. If Dharma Protocol takes off, how will that change the way people borrow and lend? And what other impacts do you think it could have, you know, maybe on the size of the debt markets or, or anything like, else like that? Yeah. Um, so I really, I pretty strongly feel that if Dharma is going to actually kind of like, you know, if the rubbers are going to, if the rubbers is really going to meet the road and we're going to have a lot of traction, I I don't necessarily, I find it less likely that that the use cases that will take off will be like the traditional sort of like use cases of debt that we imagine today, right? Like I, I find it unlikely that like that the way people are um, taking out mortgages is going to like entirely shift onto Dharma's infrastructure in the next like five to ten years. Because at the end of the day, like in in the Western world, like credit markets function like pretty well. Like it's a pretty saturated market already, right? And so I think that if we are successful, it's going to be in use cases that are initially very niche and are very specific to the crypto world. And as that world expands and kind of bleeds its way into various aspects of people's day-to-day life, then I think we're going to serve use cases and classes of debt that are really, really hard to imagine right now, Um, but that make a lot of sense in that sort of crypto or digital native context. And so it's kind of like you imagine like, yeah, like the, um, the, the, the borrowers who I gave you the example of like collateralizing a crypto kitty earlier, right? And a crypto kitty is a type of non-fungible token. Um, another type of non-fungible token is, is, you know, like this, there's this, this project called Decentraland where they, they're basically like, uh, they basically sold like plots of virtual reality land on chain, which is this kind of kooky concept. But if you kind of take that and you look at what one of those decentralized plots are, like that is similarly a non-fungible token, right? Right. And so you can imagine like literally borrowing against that decentralized plot in order to finance like a, you know, virtual reality real estate development on top of it and then to sell, you know, tickets to people who want to like put on their headsets and like walk through it or something like that. Wow. Um and so and so like I give that example because it's like it's like I view that as like a class of debt that makes like no sense in the current like real world, um, but that makes a lot of sense in a totally digitally native or crypto native context. And I think that there will be many of those sorts of use cases, things that it's, that are very difficult for us to imagine right now. And I would conjecture that that means that like in the future, like the market cap of global debt will be much much larger because debt will essentially kind of bleed its way into markets that it previously has not. Um, because we never really had the ability to like super cheaply spin up debt assets and super deep cheaply raise debt for different use cases. 
Interesting. Yeah, what you just described, it was like Monopoly meets VR or something <laughs> Monopoly like that. Monopoly meets VR. Know. That's a great way of yeah. putting it, yeah. <laughs> a couple of things I wanted to ask you about. You know, you talked about Zero X a lot. You talked about how the Relayers idea is, you know, very similar to Zero X. I know also Dharma is built on Ethereum. What is the relationship between Dharma and things like Zero X and Ethereum? Like, could you switch to another blockchain? How or how easy would it be to add other blockchains? And mm. yeah, yeah, that's a fantastic question. So, so I'll answer first of all the, the question about Zero X um, okay. because I think I think there's kind of two answers here about like our relationship to something like a Zero X versus our relationship to um, the Ethereum blockchain. So Zero X, I would put them in a category of like a, you know, being a crypto financial primitive, as in like sort of a, a basic primitive operation that is a building block for a whole lot of different types of financial instruments and eventually financial services. And I would put us in a kind of a similar bucket uh, in that like we're kind of like this building block that will eventually be used likely alongside things like Zero X or DYDX or SET or, you know, there's a whole bevy of these different uh, right. crypto financial primitive protocols um, in order to construct financial services that are globally accessible and fundamentally transparent. So, yeah, so, so that's kind of how I describe our relationship vis-a-vis Zero uh, X. As opposed, um, with respect to the Ethereum blockchain, Right now, there's not really any other like show in the game in terms of like like a blockchain that you could meaningfully build an application on top of. Um, that will likely change, and we are not like dogmatically wedded to being like built on top of the Ethereum blockchain. It's just like extremely unclear what the multi-blockchain future looks like and how like how these sort of meta protocols like Zero X and Dharma. Um, will be structured in that multi-blockchain future, right? Because you can imagine on one side of the spectrum, like that, you know, there will be many different blockchains, and that these blockchains will kind of have a distribution like um, like operating systems, right? It's like it's like Android and iOS, right? And so like every application developer will make their Android app or their iOS app. So if you know if you stretch that analogy to blockchains, you can imagine like every zero X or Dharma will have a deployment on Definity and have a deployment on Ethereum and have one on Tezos and you know you name it. So that could be the way that it pans out, but it could also be the case that these kind of interchain interoperability protocols really take off, and the whole concept of individual blockchains is just so heavily abstracted away that it doesn't even necessarily matter that like you know. It, that a zero X or a Dharma basically sits a layer above that and operates across blockchains, and there's not really any sort of concept of like what chain you're on at any given time, because these interoperability protocols make these seem so things so abstracted and seamless. And so, in summary, I'd say like I could try to like you know prognosticate here and like tell you like what exactly is the way that this is going to pan out for like a Dharma zero X, but the truth is like nobody really knows <laughs> and. Uh, um, uh, at this point in time, like uh, really the the only viable option for building on top of is Ethereum. Okay, yeah, sounds like a wait and see type answer. Yeah, um, that's not a cop out. Oh, no, no, not at all, not at all. I think it's smart. So you guys could have easily done a token sale, you know, mm. in the height of the ICO mania last year, but you chose not to. Why not? Yeah, so I have always. I've been I've been very fond of the token kind of model in general. Um, I do think there's a lot of promise to it. I do think that it's very possible that tokens are kind of like the future of capital formation and yada yada. But circa back when we were you know potentially considering doing something like a token sale, everything was super murky, and everything still is super murky right now. And when I say everything, I mean like not just you know regulatory aspects like that's that's one issue but e- even if we were to put aside the sort of regulatory murkiness of these things it's like it's not entirely clear yet how and when tokens capture value from the projects that they uh you know espouse to be tied to even ether mind you um and the the kind of economics we use to explain these things are highly highly unproven and i think like like cynically, we could say that like right now, like the crypto markets are much more a reflection of people's kind of like loose thoughts of like how successful a project or protocol is than it is actually like some sort of fundamental valuation of what these assets actually are. 
And so from our perspective, like we didn't really want to like raise money on a token if we in our heart of hearts didn't even really know if that token would accrue value if like what we built was successful. And so our approach is similarly to the kind of wait and see approach that I, I mentioned earlier is like, you know, we're not dogmatically opposed to doing a token maybe one day, but right now the market is just so nascent and young. And it's just so unclear how these things operate and how these things accrue value that we think it just makes a lot more sense to focus on just building a core ecosystem uh, and getting a lot of people essentially borrowing and lending on Dharma um, and figuring out our value capture later down the line. And do you do you make money now or do you have a plan for how you will eventually make money? We do not make money right now. No. So they're, they're, we aren't taking any sorts of fees in the actual protocol level. We have no plans of inserting fees at the protocol level at any given time. Even if we wanted to insert fees at the protocol layer, everything is open source, so it could just be forked away. As for what our plans are in the future, like you know, we are, we are not a nonprofit; we are a for-profit company. So, so we do intend on, in some way, shape, or form, capturing value. We just are very much like we kind of take a, a deliberately ambiguous approach to it now, where it's like. There are many different routes we should we could take to capture value in the future, ranging from you know providing basically like consulting services to enterprises who are trying to build on Dharma, a la kind of like the the Red Hat model mm. um, with respect to um, to their open source distribution, or it could take a route of us essentially building uh, products and services that in some way serve constituents in the actual ecosystem. Um, and that, you know, give us revenue in some capacity that way. Um, and I think like a, a analogy I like to use is that like, imagine if, you know, SMTP, the yeah. protocol for email, right? So, so SMTP is a protocol that makes it so that if you send an email from Outlook to Gmail, you know, the, it's all going to go through fine. You can imagine like if Google had developed SMTP originally and then built G Suite on top of it and kind of monetize it in that capacity, I think that's like a great example of like what it could look like for an open source protocol to be developed in a manner that's totally free, um, and then for a company to come and build services and products on top of it um, that serve users of that protocol in some capacity. Yeah, I imagine your your VCs uh, like Polychain Capital and Y Combinator and some of the others will will be interested to know. What yeah, your yeah. No, plans I mean, are. I think I think we've been lucky enough to have investors that are quite comfortable with this ambiguity. And we think that it's just we're at a point right now that's too early, at least in my opinion, to try to shoehorn a business model onto this um, when we're really just kind of like getting getting the race started right now. Okay. Yeah, I want to let people know what your background is, because when we first met, I was shocked to find out that you had just graduated from Stanford in 2017. <laughs> and it's similar to when I, you know, first discovered how young Joey Krug was, I could not believe it. And he was recently on the show. So oh, tell yeah. us your background and how you got into crypto. Yeah. So um, I got into the crypto. Sp so I used to be a student at Stanford and I was, you know, studying computer science and it was like 2015 and I took a class or I, I, I was sitting in on this talk that um, Eric Schmidt from, from Google had given. Um, and this is like really at the peak of like kind of like blockchain, not Bitcoin stuff. And, and at one point, somebody in the audience asked Eric Schmidt about like Bitcoin. And, you know, he basically gave like the blockchain, not Bitcoin spiel. He was, he was like, yeah, you know, Bitcoin's interesting, but like the technology behind it is like super, super interesting, blah, blah, blah. And so I kind of came away from that being like, huh, like blockchain, like what does that mean? And lo and behold, uh, in the fall of 2015, was it 2015 or 2016? Sorry, I'm getting mixed up. Anyways, in the fall of uh, what was then my... Uh, junior year, uh, I took a, a class at Stanford called Bitcoin and Cryptocurrencies. And it was the first time that it was taught. And I just totally fell in love with the space and just like, just completely just thought that this was like the most exciting thing happening in technology. Ended up meeting uh, Fred from Coinbase because he came in and gave a talk at that class. And kind of as a result, ended up uh, working at Coinbase for a while as an engineer, kind of as I was finishing up school. And then on the side, I'd started working on Dharma. Um, and as soon as I graduated, I kind of turned that into a full-time profession. And how did you come up with the idea for Dharma? So when I was at Coinbase, um, I was pretty struck by the fact that 
Coinbase just like sits on so much crypto assets. Like then like for the most part, they're just entirely stagnant. Like it's not like when you put your money in a bank account, it's you know accruing interest for you because the bank is presumably lending that money out to other people. Whereas if you put your kind of Bitcoin in Coinbase, um, it's just kind of sitting there uh, riding the waves of the Bitcoin market. So, uh, you know, in my head, I was like, wow, we have borderless currency. Like, how cool would it be if we had like a borderless bank? Turns out that's like really hard for a centralized institution like Coinbase to do because there's just like nine gajillion different regulatory issues that they have to be concerned with. And this is like not their number one priority. But this had kind of jiggered the idea of like, wow, we have, you know, a decentralized borderless currency. What if we had like a decentralized borderless credit market? And so I kind of started tinkering with that idea there, and, and it's evolved into what it is today. And why the name Dharma? Like, I, I <laughs> you know, I am a former yoga teacher and am interested in meditation. So I was like, that's a Buddhist word. I was like, what does that have to do with anything? Uh, well, I mean, it really depends on how, on how you cut it. Is It's both a Hindu and Buddhist concept. Oh, okay. Um, but so the reason why I chose, chose the name Dharma, so I'm like deeply fascinated with Indian culture. I've spent like a good amount of time living there. And, oh. um, and I think like Dharma is this concept that doesn't really have like a single English word for it, but at least in Hindu culture, generally it refers to like acting in accordance with one's like obligations and duties. Um, oh. and I thought that that was sort of fitting to the kind of concept of what a debt is and that a debt is basically like an obligation. Um, and so if we're talking about like, kind of like creating a universal comprehensive system for, uh, settling these obligations, I thought that Dharma would essentially be kind of a fitting title. Interesting. I like it. Um, I actually want to go back to Stanford Nash and just ask one question. Yeah. Um, you kind of mentioned sort of like what the atmosphere was around like blockchain versus Bitcoin back in 2015. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, how did the attitude around Bitcoin and crypto change within Stanford during the years you were there? Oh, man. Um, not tremendously, but I also like literally graduated right before this whole explosion of interest in, in cryptocurrencies happened. Mm. Um, so I know now things are different. And oh. that like, like, you know, I've gone back to campus now and like there's, you know, a big like blockchain club and there's, you know, like all sorts of people from like the GSB and stuff that are like trying to like get into like blockchain and cryptocurrency. So, you know, it's, it's very much like it's changed from this thing that was like a bit of like an off kilter technical curiosity to, to being like very front and center. Um, which I'm sure is the case in probably most universities. <laughs> yeah. Katie Hahn and um, Susan Athey taught a class at the GSB on yeah. crypto in the in this spring. And I think it was like oversubscribed. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, so you guys recently launched. What kinds of volume and behaviors have you been seeing in terms of the loan activity on, on Dharma? Yeah. So so there's been around something like uh, like almost 150K in loans that have been issued via Dharma since we launched in May. The vast, vast majority of these, I'd say, fall into the kind of like speculative camp as in like they're basically people um, who are trying to either like leverage their existing assets or uh, like short certain assets. And because right now there's not for for a lot of ERC twenty tokens is not really a good way of doing either of those things. Like I think that that's kind of the primary driver of volume right now. But we've been seeing a lot of really exciting and interesting development interest, um, and in terms of like companies that are like in the pipeline right now um, for use cases that aren't necessarily speculative per se. And you know we can dive into some of those if you're interested. But you know I, I, they they kind of fall into a lot of the buckets of the things that I that I kind of listed earlier in terms of things like uh, NFT based loans or okay. or even like you know credit to facilitate plasma withdrawals and things like that. Okay. Well, because you started off by talking about people in the developing world being yeah. able to. Ha- do you have any plan for kind of extending this out? It sounds like it's probably a lot of Westerners that are big in this speculative mania right now yeah, that are using yeah. it. But, you know, how do you plan to kind of reach the the audience that you feel like could really use this? Yeah, I mean, I think like the, the sober realistic answer here is that it's like, I, I think that like, that will those use cases will come. But there are a lot of other bottlenecks that kind of need to be ironed out before that happens. Um, and a lot of them are kind of like outside of our general control. Like, you know, we just came back from India, actually, we were we were there. Um, for the ETH India hackathon. Um, and we were talking to people on the ground there who were interested in building out, you know, like, you know, micro lending underwriters or something like that in the Dharma protocol. 
And the fundamental problem that they have is that it's like, okay, unless the people are totally willing and able to accept cryptocurrency, they're going to want to convert it back to rupees. Um, and currently, that's really hard to do in India because like the Indian government has like heavily clamped down. On, right. on exchanges. Um, and so, and I think that's like a, just an example that's indicative of like, there's just a lot of like bottlenecks in making crypto adoption happen in like the third world that are just totally out of our control right now. And so, like, you know, we can academically talk about the things that we can do to like make, make Dharma like more accessible for like developing world use cases. But I, I think that realistically in the short term, um, as I kind of stated earlier, it's going to start with very crypto native use cases and kind of expand concentrically from there. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So are there any other developments that are forthcoming or new apps or, or anything that are being built that you're excited about? Oh, man, not a lot that I can share publicly. <laughs> um, but all I can say is that if you are interested uh, in building a business in the cryptocurrency industry, and you're looking for, to, to get involved in a way that doesn't require you to have deep technical knowledge, we think that building a relay or underwriter in Dharma is a very low-hanging fruit in terms of being able to capture value from this, this nascent industry. Um, and so uh, we'd love to kind of get in touch if you're interested and support you. Well, great. This has been a fabulous discussion. Where can people learn more about you and Dharma? So if you go to dharma.io, D-H-A-R-M-A.io, that's our website, you can find our blog there. You can find all of our technical materials there that should kind of walk you through what it's like to build an application on top of Dharma. And uh, we'd love to have you join our Telegram, Telegram channel. It's you know, the most classic cryptocurrency statement ever, but um, that's kind of where you can find the whole team uh, and pick our brains on anything. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that's, that's it. Okay, great. Well, thanks for coming on Unchained. Awesome. Thank you so much, Laura. Thanks so much for joining us today. To learn more about Nadav and Dharma, check out the show notes inside your podcast episode. New episodes of Unchained come out every Tuesday. If you haven't already, rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. If you liked this episode, share it with your friends on Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. And if you're not yet subscribed to my other podcast, Unconfirmed, I highly recommend you check it out and subscribe now. Unchained is produced by me, Laura Shin, with help from Raylene Gallipoli, Fractal Recording, Jenny Josephson, Rahul Singaretti, and Daniel Ness. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.